Hi everyone, uh, I'm Etienne Chouchou and I'm going to give you fresh updates about uh, the new Beam Runner based on a Spark Structure Streaming Framework. Uh, this talk is a continuation of the talk I gave last year at the ApacheCon uh, to present the building of, of this uh, new runner. And uh, it belongs to uh, the big data track, even though it was put uh, in the streaming track. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm a software engineer at Talend, uh, and I'm an Apache Beam committer and PMC member. Uh, I'm also contributing to Apache Flink and a bit to Apache Spark. Uh, you can uh, catch me on Twitter uh, by email or uh, with my blog. Um, at Talend, we do data integration software. Uh, in that case, the screenshot is Pipeline Designer. It's a tool that allows to, be, uh, to build big data pipelines by assembling UI components, uh, and it's uh, based on BIM. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, I will start with an introduction to BIM for those who, who don't know it. Uh, I will then do a very brief uh, introduction to Spark Structure Streaming Framework. I will then uh, give you uh, the overall uh, BIM runner architecture so that you could know what a runner is. I will then switch to latest improvements in terms of features. I will then dig into a problem that we have with the Spark Structure Streaming Framework. And um, I will then give updates on uh, performances and a conclusion. So as an introduction to BIM, I will just give this quote. Um, BIM is a programming model uh, that allows to create big data pipelines and it's unified between batch and streaming uh, with a unified API, I mean. Uh, so that's because we believe that there is no real difference between a batch pipeline and a streaming pipeline. The only difference is that uh, the streaming pipeline deals with an infinite collection of data, whereas the, by pipe, the batch pipeline deals with a finite collection of data. And all you need to do is to divide uh, this infinite data into finite chunks, so the overall uh, batch problem can be seen as a subset of the streaming problem. And to divide the data, all you need is windowing and uh, being provided. Uh, that's the beam stack. Uh, on top of it, you have the user code. So that's the pipeline written uh, by the user using the libraries of transforms and the IOs that are provided by the language SDKs. Uh, there are several language SDKs one for Java, one for Python, one for Go, and they all expose um, the Beam model concepts like windowing. We will see that later on. Um, and the bottom layer is the focus of interest of this talk. It's the translation layer uh, between a pipeline written with the Beam API and a native uh, pipeline for Spark, for Flink, for Dataflow that will be executed by the actual engine. Um, the Beam transforms Actually, there are only three beam transforms, three primitives. Uh, there's the Pardu, which is the good old flat map that is basically um, an event-wise um, processing, an, an element-wise processing, sorry. Uh, and the group by key, um, which is a way to group elements into groups that could be later on processed in parallel downstream the pipeline. And there is the read that is there to ingest data into the pipeline. All the other um, uh, transforms available in the Beam SDKs are composites of Pardu and group by key. Even the reducer equ equivalent, which is called combine in Beam, uh, is uh, implemented by Beam SDK as a Pardu and a group by key. Uh, this is the traditional, usual uh, example, very straight, very simple pipeline that uh, reads text file, counts the occurrences of the words, and uh, prints the output to a text file. Uh, it is there just to show you uh, the Beam API. So we have uh, the, the pipeline, uh, which is the user interaction with the pipeline. Uh, we have the P collection object, which is an abstraction of the data 
spread across the cluster. Uh, we have several transforms, flat map, counts, map elements, and text IO that allows to read from text file and write to text file. Uh, so um, this slide is the BIM vision. Um, it's to say that you can write your pipeline using whatever language SDK in Java, Python, or Go, and run it on any uh, big data engine that is supported, uh, no matter what the language was used to write it. For example, you can write a Python pipeline and run it on Spark, which is coded in Scala. So uh, this is quite out of the scope of this talk because it's portability. It will be dealt with tomorrow but by Alexei Romanenko, but I needed to mention it. Um, so this is the first um, model uh, concept of BIM, which is windowing. Uh, windowing is a way to temporarily group elements based on their even timestamp, the timestamp at which, at which the element occurred. And, and it's mandatory for streaming because you need to divide the infinite data, as I said before, uh, but it's optional uh, for batch mode because even in batch mode, you can set your timestamp on your data and still apply windowing. Um, we have several types of windows. Uh, we have the fixed windows uh, that, that allows to uh, uh, express things like, I want to have the last 30 seconds of data. We have the sliding windows that allow to express things like, I want to have the last 60 seconds of data uh, every 30 seconds. We also have the session windows that are very similar to web session, meaning that they are defined by a gap duration. So let's say we have a 30 seconds gap duration set. Um, if we receive no elements, uh, for more than 30 seconds in even time, then the next element will be considered as belonging to the next session. Uh, we also provide two special kind of windows, uh, the global window, which is the default one, uh, the one you get when you don't specify your window, that's the window that contains all the elements in batch mode, uh, all the elements of the pipeline, of course. Uh, and we also have a special custom window that is basically the way for the user to specify for a given element based on its timestamp to what uh, window it should belong. So that's a function to implement for the user. Uh, another very, very important concept of BIM is watermarks. We will deal with that later on. But I need to say that for the watermarks, um, that for all the streaming systems, we always have problems like lag between the event timestamp, so it's the time at which the element occurred, and the processing time, which is the time at which the element was processed by the system. And we also have out-of-order data. And to deal with those two points, we provide what we call a watermark. A watermark is uh, a point in time where we should not receive older elements. In other words, uh, it's the system notion uh, that all the data for a certain window is expected to have arrived to have come in the pipeline. So if I, if I take a very simple example, very naive, of a um, 10 minute lag watermark, um, very static watermark, um, at, at 2.10, uh, the system will consider that no element with timestamp older than two o'clock can arrive. So it's a lag of 10 minutes watermark. Uh, the watermark is set by the source and it's propagated throughout the pipeline uh, through the different uh, transforms. Um, and a corollary to that is lake data. Uh, lake data is data that, ar that arrives after the watermark. So if I take my previous example of this uh, simple uh, 10 minutes lag watermark, for a given element, if it has a timestamp of 159 and it arrives at 211, then as at 210, the watermark will consider that no element older than two can arrive, then this element with timestamp 159 will be considered late. And it will be dropped unless we set what we call a load lateness. And a load lateness is a tolerance in time um, and in that case, it avoids uh, the element dropping. So 
for the previous example of this element with timestamp 159, uh, to avoid that it's dropped, you need to set an load lateness of at least two minutes. Another um, model um, concept important is triggering. Uh, triggering is what tells BIM when to output data. The default trigger is when the watermark passes the end of the window. So with my previous naive static watermark example of 10 minutes lag, um, uh, a, a given fixed window of one hour from one to two will be closed at 210 because at 210, the watermark value will be two o'clock and it will pass the end of the window. So that's when the output will come and the uh, buffers will be cleaned and all these things in the, uh, in the data output. Um, there are several types of triggers, events-based uh, triggers, even time-based triggers uh, based on time stop of elements, processing time triggers that are based on the time at which the elements were seen or processed by the system, and data-driven triggers that are based on the count of elements. But we also can have early triggers that emit data before the window closes. It's useful for preview. And also late data triggers that emit uh, their data um, after the watermark has passed the end of the window. Uh, I will now do a very quick introduction uh, to the Spark Structure Streaming Framework. Uh, it's a framework that was released in beta in, with Spark 2.0 in July 16. It's based on Spark SQL, and it provides an API unified for batch and streaming that is called Dataset or Data Frame. Uh, it, is, it has a type and a schema enforcement. You actually define your, the structure of your data, and it gets enforced uh, by the, uh, the, the framework, uh, but it's still micro-batched. Um, even, be, even though they defined uh, the, the continuous processing mode that is not micro-batched and that, that is available for low latency pipelines, uh, this mode does not support aggregation in streaming at all. You cannot do a group by uh, uh, with the continuous processing mode. So it's not useful for BIM because obviously we need to do aggregations. Um, as uh, it has also an optimizer that is called Catalyst that is very similar to a SQL optimizer. Uh, its job is to optimize the execution plan of the Spark queries. So that will be all for the Spark interaction. I will uh, dig into the subject of the Beam runner itself. So you remember the pipeline I gave in the introduction, the very simple one that reads text file. Actually, uh, this uh, example, this pipeline, uh, will result uh, when the SDK will uh, pass it, it will, uh, the SDK will construct uh, a graph such as this one on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, it's the direct acyclic graph. So, uh, the, so the shirt is DAG. Uh, it contains only beam transforms. So read, flat map, count, map elements and write. And this is what is used as an input for the runner translation. Uh, the job of the runner is to translate the ZAG uh, to uh, the uh, native pipeline code that you see on the right hand side. Of course, it's pseudo code, but you see that it's native Spark because there is back session, read, data source v2, flat map, and all these things. And this is this actual native pipeline that will be run. Uh, in the Spark cluster. And um, let's take a look at the left-hand side for a bit. Um, you remember that I said in the introduction that there were only a few primitives in BIM. So read is a primitive, uh, but flat map is not. Flat map is implemented in the SDK as a pardo. Uh, count is not a primitive either. It's implemented as a beam combine, which is itself not a primitive. As I said before, it's implemented in the SDK as a group by key and a pardo. And map elements is a pardo and write is a pardo. Uh, what happens there is that the runner job is to translate. So it will visit this tag, but it can choose the level of translation. It's the object of the, these green boxes. Um, for the read, 
there's no point because it's a primitive, so it gets directly translated to a Spark read with data source V2 API. And the Pardu is translated as a Spark flat map. And but that, where it's interesting is with the combine, because with the combine, we could have chosen to translate the beam a group by key to a Spark group by key and a Pardu to a Spark flat map, but it would have been less performant than uh, directly translating the beam combine to a Spark aggregator because they are equivalent. So that, that is more performant to, to uh, do the translation at that level. Um, so when the uh, runner um, visits this DAG, it creates an input data set as a result of the read, stores uh, this data set and applies it, the first transform, stores the output data set and use it as an input for next step and so on and so on and so on and until we reach the output data set. <coughs> that <coughs> will be the final data set of the pipeline and we will apply to, to it an action. In that case, it will be a, a, a for each uh, action uh, because it's a, it's a batch pipeline. Uh, so now how do you run this a new a pipeline with this new runner. You simply replace the dash dash runner equals Spark runner in Beam command line by dash dash runner equals Spark social streaming runner. And you will get an output, an output such as this. Uh, in that case, it's a very simple example of a Pardu that is executed on data. Uh, and uh, this screenshot is uh, the output of Catalyst. It's the physical plan that is actually executed by the Spark engine. So it's readable from bottom to top. So you can see it starts with a source uh, in batch mode. It then applies the binary schema uh, defined. Uh, the source um, creates row, so it deserialized to row. Uh, and then we, uh, with a map element, uh, um, uh, deserialize to window value because window value is the object that the beam pipeline deal with in the inside. It's window plus data. Uh, and we then apply the part that is de defined by the user in the beam pipeline. And uh, after that, it's the, the, the result is reserialized uh, to, to bytes so that uh, Spark could uh, deal with the data for downstream the pipeline. Uh, I will now uh, give you the latest improvements uh, in case you already tested this Spark Runner. Uh, there were some minor fixes, uh, like the flatten. Uh, the flatten is a merge of two P collection, and it now works on MTP collections. Uh, we also avoided staging uh, of the jars in Spark local mode, because in this mode, uh, the, the Spark engine runs inside the same JVM, so there is already the libs in the Casper, so we don't need to stage the jars. Uh, we also improved the pipeline options um, by splitting them between the, the current uh, RDD streams uh, based runner options and the structure streaming uh, based uh, for, for the structure streaming runner options. Um, and uh, we introduced uh, the test mode uh, that, that you saw in the previous slides, uh, the log that you saw is the test mode output for the, the execution plans of Spark. And we also fixed uh, the materialization in batch mode because at the end Spark needs to materialize data and for that it needs to apply an action to the output data set. So in batch we chose to apply the forage. Um, we did also a, a good amount of work on the combine translation. So as I said, the combine in BIM is the equivalent of reduce in big data. Um, let's say that we have a cluster with three executors. Uh, so as I said, the P collection is spread across the cluster. So it's divided into three. And for each executor, BIM creates uh, an accumulator, a local accumulator, to which the data of the local part of the P collection get added. And then the accumulators get merged between each other into a single accumulator that resides on a single uh, a single uh, executor. And it is 
it's accumulator that gets extracted to produce the output data. So what's important in that is that you saw in the introduction that we have complex windowing. For that, we cannot rely on Spark windowing. We use our own uh, windowing with the windowed value that you saw in the, in the logs uh, that contains windowing information. So as a consequence, when we merge, we need, when we merge the data and the accumulators, we need to merge uh, by uh, the windows. So we need to merge the accumulators by, by that target windows and the data as well. So uh, it's important that to know that we had a lot of work to, to deal with uh, window merging. Um, there is also now the sliding window type that is support. And there were minor fixes on timestamp and instance reuse. Uh, instance reuse because um, Beam tries to uh, spare as uh, less memory as possible, so it reuses instances of the accumulators, and uh, we need proper real reinitialization. Um, we also now support beam coders. Uh, what are beam coders? Beam coder is simply a serializer deserializer. It's an in, it's an interface. Uh, so they encode for a serialization of an element to a byte array and decode for the deserialization of this byte array to uh, the uh, element. Um, these coders are either provided by the user, uh, which just implements this interface, and it can be also provided by the SDK. So the SDK provides several coders, beam coders for, for several types. Uh, and these coders are very, very similar to Spark encoders. Uh, but before uh, talking about Spark encoders, I will just do a, a quick part of on the Catalyst Optimizer, uh, Spark Catalyst Optimizer. Like I said before, it's similar to a SQL opt uh, Optimizer. Uh, its job is to iteratively apply rules uh, to the user DAG to generate at the end the best physical plan uh, possible. So it iteratively applies rules to, to end up with that. Um, and Catalyst sees the, the input pipeline as a tree made of tree nodes. And there is a special kind of tree nodes that is called Catalyst Expressions. And there is a special type of Catalyst Expressions that are expression encoders. And that's th those expression encoders are actually custom Spark encoders. And that's what we used to uh, wire up, to wrap the beam coders into a custom Spark encoders as a, a, an expression encoder. Uh, but what's important to notice there is that all Catalyst expressions generate Java code. Actually, they generate um, strings of Java. And these strings of Java are compiled by the Janino compiler in, at the Spark site when Catalyst uh, processes them. And this is this code, uh, these Java strings that call uh, the beam coder. Uh, so what's the current state of this new runner? Uh, it was merged to beam master. Uh, it covers 100% of the beam core features. There is still optional features uh, that are not yet implemented, like the state API, like the timer API, like the splitable DoFN API, and also side inputs in combine are an ongoing work. Uh, the beam schemas are not wired up with uh, Spark schemas. Uh, we use for now uh, Spark binary schemas. Uh, also the runner can execute Nextmark in batch mode. So what is Nextmark? Nextmark is our internal beam performance framework that covers 100% of the model and that simulates an auction system. It simulates persons creating auctions, placing bids on items, and then it queries the system for statistical data, such as what's the average uh, selling price in the United States. And these queries are uh, actually uh, beam pipelines. Uh, this runner is uh, only in batch mode, only available in batch mode, uh, because the streaming mode uh, is not supported yet because we have a problem uh, with the Spark structure streaming framework, uh, which is at the Spark side. Uh, that will be uh, the focus of next, park, next part. Uh, so the multiple 
aggregation problem in Spark Structure Streaming Framework? Uh, well, um, the problem is that this framework does not support multiple aggregation. It does not support more than one aggregation in a streaming pipeline. So there's an open ticket and there is also an ongoing PR, but it has not received uh, an update since August 19. And there is also an ongoing Spark design, but that received no update since June 19. So the BIM project is stuck with the new runner based on Spark Structure Streaming Framework, waiting for the support for more than one aggregation in a streaming mode. Uh, so what's the underlying problem that, that is at the Spark side? Um, actually, the problem uh, is the watermark scope in Spark. Um, this scope is global for the old pipeline. There is no watermark pair operation. And how it works is that at the end of each micro batch, the watermark is updated with the newest timestamp received. So if I take an example like below, a streaming pipeline with two aggregations in a row. So that's not supported. We will see how it doesn't work. Uh, so there is the first aggregation that outputs the highest value in the window of three seconds. So let's say that we receive three elements with value six, four, and five, and timestamp one, two, and three. So they get buffered in the uh, uh, operation one. The operation one updates the global watermark to value three because it's the newest timestamp scene. So as a result, when the operation one outputs its data, no luck, the highest is value six, but it has timestamp one. And as the global watermark is value three, then this element with timestamp one will be considered by operation two as late. So then it will be dropped and this will lead to incorrect results. So as a consequence to avoid incorrect results, then the Spark uh, project deactivate the support of more than one aggregation in streaming pipeline with this uh, structure streaming framework. Uh, a, po a possible solution that we uh, discussed with the Spark community is to replace uh, this global watermark by watermarks Pair transform. And these uh, watermark values will be propagated through the pipeline from the source throughout the different Spark operations. And each operation will update their local watermark as they receive data. And we define for each of these operations an input watermark, which is defined as the minimum of the output watermark of the previous operations. Of course, this minimum is only for Y pipelines. If you have a straight pipeline, then the, the uh, input watermark is the minimum of the output water, uh, is, the, is directly uh, the output watermark of the previous step. Uh, and the output watermark is the minimum between the local input watermark and the oldest process. So let's say now uh, in an example, how it works. So we take the very same example like before, only this time we define a watermark per operation. So there is one for the source, there is one for operation one and one for operation two. And also let's say that the source at some point says that the watermark is one, meaning that we should not receive older elements than timestamp one. This watermark gets propagated through the operation, the operations, like I said, so the input watermark of operation one is the output watermark of previous step, so it's one. The output watermark of operation one is the minimum between the oldest process and the input watermark, so it's one. And for operation two, the input watermark is the output watermark of previous step, so it's one. And the output watermark of operation two is the minimum between the oldest process and the local input watermark, so it's one. So let's say now that we receive the very same three elements with value six, four, and five in timestamp one, two, and three. So they get buffered inside operation one. So 
the operation one updates its current oldest process counter to the oldest timestamp because it's the oldest process counter. So it's timestamp one. Uh, so it does not update its output watermark because the output watermark is the minimum between the input watermark and the oldest process. So it's still one. So if the output watermark of operation one is not updated, then the input and output watermark of operation two will not be updated either. So now let's say that the source says now that the watermark is three, meaning that we should not receive all the elements that timestamp three. What happens is that this watermark is propagated to the input watermark of operation one. And now something interesting happens because the input watermark of operation one is value three. So the watermark has passed the end of the window. So if you remember the, what I said on the triggers, then um, the watermark has passed the end of the window of three seconds. So it should output its data. So operation one should output its data. So it will do so. So cleans this buffer, outputs its data. So it will output as before the value six times stamp one. But now as the watermark is local, the, out, the input watermark of operation two has not changed, it's still one. This element with timestamp one is no more uh, considered uh, late and it will not be dropped. It will just be buffered and processed. So. Uh, operation two will just update its current process counter to one. And now you may wonder, uh, when do the, these watermarks get updated? Well, let's say we receive another element with timestamp four, with value seven, it gets preferred in operation one. So it this time the operation one updates is all this process counter to four. So now four is higher than three. So the output watermark, which is the minimum between the two, uh, gets updated to three. So as the output watermark of operation one is updated, then the input watermark of operation two will be updated to its value. So it will be now three. And the local output watermark of operation two will be also updated to three. So now you know how could the watermark be updated with the arrival of value and throughout the, the operations. I will now uh, give updates about uh, the, the uh, uh, performances of uh, the, the new uh, runner. Um, well, what do we do uh, for performances? Actually, uh, we um, uh, schedule load tests per transform uh, on, a, on a schedule basis. Um, we also run uh, next mark uh, on each commit on master to follow uh, the, the performance of, of the runner. And we also did some profiling on the next mark queries uh, to spot places to improve. And as a development uh, process, we also for each new change um, run load tests to ensure that there is no uh, performance regression. So um, it led to uh, some improvements, uh, but also some failures. Uh, so the improvements uh, br brought by the beam cutters, um, when, uh, well, previously, uh, before being compatible with beam cutters, we used cryo encoders that uh, are generic encoders, the generic Spark encoders uh, to serialize data. And we replaced it by the things I presented and uh, it gained 40% in execution time. Uh, for that, we minimized uh, the generated code. So we used as much JDK compiled code and as little Janino compiled code. You remember the, the Java strings I mentioned. Um, for the group by key, we uh, uh, managed to remove uh, an internal beam flat map in the translation from beam to Spark and it gained 20%. Um, we also are, are refactoring right now the combined beam translation to support side inputs. So what are, the, what are side inputs? Beam side inputs are like a view of on, on a P collection, and this view can be injected to a transform. 
combine in that case. So it could be useful for something like a, a reference table that you want to cross with uh, data uh, coming to a combine, for example. And these term views actually um, right now use broadcast variables. And to use Spark broadcast variables, you need to serialize data. So you need to materialize your data to set the broadcast variable. And this could have been avoided. Uh, we could have been avoided materializing the data by using Spark term views. And Spark term views um, are like SQL views. <coughs> Sorry, they can be cached and they can be also lazily evaluated. Uh, and it could have been then a better performance uh, candidate uh, for uh, the beam side input translation. And it has failed because Spark SQL uh, context uh, cannot be passed to a map because it, ca it, it is not serializable. So we cannot use temp views uh, to, to translate uh, the, the beam side inputs. Uh, so we stuck to um, broad cost variables. Um, updated performance. Um, this performance uh, chart is the um, execution time of um, the next mark queries. So there are 14 of them. So you remember next mark is uh, the uh, simulation of the auction system and the queries are, let's say, statistical questions on the system. Um, it's a run that was done on a hundred thousand events uh, uh, with, uh, let's say, uh, um, a local spark of uh, four threads. And um, we see in blue uh, the uh, execution time of each query uh, for in blue for the new Spark runner based on Spark Social Streaming Framework. And in red, uh, the, the uh, response time for the current Spark runner based on RDD and DStream. Um, and you can see that in some places, uh, the, the new runner behaves better than the current one uh, because the, the bars are lower. Uh, in other places, they behave similarly, like in query number zero or one. And in some cases, the new runner is worse in performance than the current runner. Uh, that could be explained uh, by the fact that uh, there was a lot more performance improvement on the current RDD DStream runner because it is still considered by the Bing community as the main Spark runner. Uh, also, that's, that can be explained by the use of binary schemas uh, in this new runner. As a consequence, uh, Catalyst cannot uh, do some optimizations. The, the optimizations that are based on fields, as it sees only a byte array, uh, it, it cannot uh, do uh, field-based uh, optimizations. Uh, and also another thing is that as we use binary schemas, we serialize the whole contents of data. And on, in some uh, cases, we, we could have serialized only uh, one field. Uh, so it could have been quarter performance uh, in that case. Um, so I will uh, jump to the conclusion. Uh, as a conclusion, I will just say that uh, contributions are welcome. Um, also, feel free to join uh, the Spark Runner uh, Beam channel, uh, Beam channel, and also take a look at uh, the Apache Beam uh, website. Uh, you can join the Beam mailing list. You can uh, follow us on the Beam uh, handle, uh, and also if you need some more details. Um, on, on some of the topics of the talk, you can take a look at my previous talks. The, the first one on the spatial source streaming framework uh, runner that uh, explains the building. Uh, you can also take a look at this next Mark talk. And uh, if you need some more details on the Spark encoders, you can take a look at uh, the blog I, I wrote on, on this topic. Um, I will also say that my friend Alexei Romanenko will present a talk tomorrow uh, about portability. Um, uh, so that's cross-language uh, pipelines. Uh, so I, I uh, urge you to uh, take a, a look at, at his uh, session. 
if you have uh, some questions, I am a bit late. Uh, I maybe can uh, take one uh, question. Is it possible to estimate the hover rate of BIM using structural spark based native uh, structural stock performance? Well, very good question. Um, actually, as far as I know, this overhead was never measured. Um, the, a good way to do so will be uh, to pick up uh, some of the, the, the more important Nextmark queries and recode them using Spark Native and compare the, the response time of the two with the, the, the runner, with the native pipeline. Um, but what I can say, I don't have figures to show, but what I can say is that when Beam uh, uh, executes pipeline.run, uh, it uh, does first the translation that I presented in the architecture, and then when the native pipeline that I showed in the native Spark is produced, then it's that that is run in the Spark uh, engine itself. So there is no more Beam at that point. Of course, there are still uh, the, uh, uh, the wrappers uh, to, to call a beam code, but no more translation. And uh, you must know that we try to use as minimum wrappers to reduce memory, as minimal wrappers as possible. We also use as minimum internal steps like uh, in the beam translation, forcing a serialization. We try not to do so, not to have these internal steps, and we also tried uh, to be as native as possible, like I said in the architecture part, uh, with the combined translation that is more performance to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, translate at the combined level rather than uh, translating the group by key, the inner group by key with a Spark group by key and the inner Pardu with a Spark flat map. It is more performance to, to use the native Spark aggregator to translate uh, the uh, beam combine. So that's it. I hope I have answered your question. Um, I will, I'm late for by a minute. So I will uh, give a big thanks uh, for joining. Um, thank you uh, for attending uh, the talk and uh, see you around in the conference.